was what was it now like a year and a half two years At ago least. um and uh, of course in our knowledge we're trying to include ourselves in our knowledge and of course over the last one and a half two years we've all changed a lot um and the whole conversations changed changed us a lot and we all went through our own personal ups and downs our our, our self discoveries our our you know our our uh you know difficulties and 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 struggles with relationships and life so we're just going to come back to these topics try to go into them deeper try to go into them um with new eyes and and just cultivate once again that 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 willingness to approach topics which might be taboo which might be on a, on 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 the the fringe of of normal conversations but are nonetheless so important and so integral for um building a conscious life today because more and more you know we need deep deep conversations to know you know ethics of action and 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 know how to interpret the complexity of the world because you know the world is just getting so complex and and how to act and how to how to be a human being is is just you know it's it's a constant challenge so so with that being said i just want to uh, introduce this topic the trilogue today is uh about sexual difference and that mirrors from the book that is uh being released the first chapter sexual difference so let me just open here with a reflection on what we mean by sexual difference so by sexual difference we basically mean that there are there is rather a process of sexuation within human beings that seems to occur at least in our intuition between two different entities we can call them man and woman we can call it masculine and feminine um we could have many different labels and of course this binary this gender binary has been um you know challenged in our culture but nonetheless when it comes to the real of sexual activity when it comes to you know like the, you know the actual sexual act um nonetheless sexual difference appears centrally you know irrespective of the uh, gender mode of gender identification so um there have been many different models to think and approach sexual difference um and what i want to offer the two of you in this dialogue is a model i have been thinking on um but before i introduce that model let me just give you a quote um from slavoj zizek because throughout this trilogue series you know i'm personally going to be bringing in some of the philosophy that that i that i've studied and i've i've studied a lot of a lot of zizek and i think that his philosophy specifically you know is really engaged in a deep way in in how philosophy should think sex in the 21st century. So let me just let me just give that quote before I before I propose a model. The quote is The absolute between man and woman is a pure antagonism. This pure antagonism is structured as sexual difference, which as difference precedes the two terms between which it is the difference. What that means basically is that when we think about man and woman as or any two terms in a in a romantic union as as you know harmonious balanced two becoming one what we're obfuscating is an antagonism and the basic claim he says is that this antagonism structured by sexual difference precedes comes before the two identities which emerge So in other words when we become a man or when we become a woman there's something a sexual difference which precedes both the becoming of those identities so in what that means in some sense is that there's you know there's 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 you could say for example there's something wrong our our egos our egos perceive there's something wrong before we decide to subjectify as man or a woman So becoming a man or a woman is more of an effect it's more epiphenomenal it's not really the core and so when the identity of man or woman 
then comes up with an image to resolve the sexual difference, it fails. Because, because it doesn't understand what, what's happened, really. So it's coming from that place, coming from that place to sexual difference, let me just propose a model. And it's, it's, I'm going to situate this model in opposition to a model that's often used in, in, um, in spiritual communities. And I know, uh, Daniel, you've explored this model, which is the model of yin and yang. So the model of yin and yang is basically, and Daniel, in your, uh, when you thought, you correct me if I'm wrong, right? So in the model of yin and yang, what I understand is what it's trying to communicate is a harmonious balance. It's trying to communicate a harmonious balance between two entities, which are really one. Okay. Now, I think that if you look at the real of sexual difference as it operates in history without images, that this is not how sexual difference operates. Sexual difference is much more violent. Sexual difference is much more catastrophic. Sexual difference is much more disturbing than that. Now, we can put up the image of the harmonious balance, and maybe it functions for pragmatic reasons not saying it doesn't function for pragmatic reasons. I'm not saying there isn't reasons why someone would come up with a yin yang model. However, the model I'm thinking about is, and hopefully this will be funny. The model I'm thinking about is um, the symbiote of venom and carnage. If any of you guys have studied comic books, in comic books in Spider-Man, there's something called the symbiote. The symbiote is like an alien entity which attaches onto its host and parasitizes it and actually um, creates this type of strange dual identity where um, the host is in some sense simultaneously charged with superpowers and at the same time parasitized from within, potentially going to be sacrificed for the will of the symbiote. Now, what I'm saying with this model of symbiote as a model of sexual difference is that this is actually how individuals experience the real of sexual difference. That there's kind of like in sexuality when you become the man or when you become the woman, it's kind of like you put on the symbiote. You know, you, you put on the, the alien, you know, you've transformed yourself from a normal human being into some image which would capture the desire of the other and which would make you one with the other. Now, at the same time, in order to embody that image, you have to sacrifice a lot about yourself. And so in that sense, what I'm saying is that it's kind of like a parasite host relationship. And this model of a parasite host relationship and this, this, what, it, what it means, bringing it to the real of sexual difference, is that instead of viewing sexual difference as this harmonious balance, what I think I see anyway when I look at sexual difference is what I see is a conflictual arms race. There's an arms race between the two terms which call themselves man and which call themselves woman, and, the, and basically what the image of each difference is trying to do is opposite um, to the other one. And so that's why there's an arms race where, and, and now that's where all the deception occurs because one, one, one term of the sexual difference is trying to magnify this you know, uh, aim or desire. And then the other has to respond to that in order to keep up. And then, and then it tries to maximize its you know, central interest and desire. And then the other term has to respond to that. And so there's this constant antagonistic push and pull between the two terms, but it doesn't really get to sort of you know, this difference as such, because on the level of the ego, both terms are trying to turn the other into one. So it doesn't really understand that there's, you know, there's this constant push and pull tug and that, and that our identities in order to become acceptable in the sexual field of sexual difference have to almost parasitize ourselves. You know, like if you look at the way women dress up on Instagram or whatever, this is, this is what I would call parasitizing oneself.
you know, uh, but you're also gaining superpowers, you know, but also when men, you know, try to, you know, bulk up at the gym, you know, they're, they're parasitizing themselves, but they're also, you know, they're participating in this conflictual arms race, you know, so this is sort of, this is sort of the things that I'm, I'm, I'm trying to introduce here to, you know, get us to think about the way in which the image of sexual difference, you know, the way I subjectify as a man, you know, is, is, is playing itself out in this tension and also the way women and play themselves out with their image and, and so forth. So if that makes sense, I'll throw that to you, Kevin, and, and let's, let's, hopefully this is a good way to, to start this conversation. <laughs> Well, I mean, major props for bringing carnage and venom and the symbiote from Spider-Man into this trilogue. Didn't see that one coming, but I, I love some comic <laughs> books, so well played, sir. And I don't know how you did it, but you did it. And it makes sense. Um, yeah, I mean, well, I guess there's just really two main points I want to add into the mixture, and then I'll pass it to you, Daniel. It's very simple for me. Um, and, and, and I come from a place of not knowing and, and having not known concrete answers about this. That's why we're even doing this whole series together is an inquiry and like a lot of pain in my life around relating and trying to understand it. So on one level, like, yes, does the yin and yang, masculine and feminine in harmony, two parts of the whole, ultimately um, symbiotic in the positive sense where both sides grow, they both trade, you know, I think that that is a possibility, a flavor, a mythology of symbols that's useful. Absolutely. Now, where I agree with you, Cadell, is that the, the negativity and the pain and the confusion around what it is to be a man, what it is to be a woman, how is a man different than a woman? How can a man be sexual with a woman? What, what are the layers of relating? I mean, yeah, the, we're just now getting language. I mean, this is probably behind some of the unconscious impulse and writing our book and also doing this work is most of civilization has gone without that language. And we've just relegated it to the poets, to the, you know, to the artists be like, please tell us what love is. Cause we don't know what the fuck's going on, but we like the pretty ideas and the flowers. And we like, you know, the white dress at the altar, but we actually don't know what's going on because the reality is a lot of suffering and pain and, and confusion. I think that is offset with an equal, at least equal, if not greater amount of positivity and, and real joy and fulfillment and love. So it is this interesting kind of two-faced thing. Um, but yeah, the, the negativity is obfuscated and I believe that's a problem of language. You know, we have a million different words to describe the perfect angular representation of, of how a screw fits into this geometric mechanical engineered process. But, we only have a few emotional words, right? I love you. I hate you. I feel good about you. Yeah, I feel good. Like our emotional language is like thousands of years behind our technical language. And I think this is behind part of the reason why so much that is felt is unspoken. And then so much that has been spoken has been unfelt between man, the entity and woman, the entity. And so that is where a lot of our problem lies. The second quick thing I want to say to your model, Cadell, which I, as a comic book geek myself, I love. Um, as a lived actor and entity in relating to the feminine, I disagree on the parasitizing nature. Because, yes, it's true that if you are in the mainstream, right, and you're a woman, and you, you know, you get a boob job or you get Botox or you just do these ruthless, unhealthy body imaging technologies, whatever that is, working out, starving yourself, pills, chemicals, procedures. You know, I think women get the brunt of that negativity and that is parasitical. Um, men, it's very different, but similar. Get the car, get the money, get the job. Yeah, go to the gym, take steroids, become alpha, like don't give a fuck, don't show any weakness. Those extremes of, of man and woman, the terms, 100% parasitize. So you nailed that. I think most people, however, when they, when they encounter sexual difference, it's not something they have to put on and, and embody. 
I mean, the people that are trying really hard, it's coming from insecurity is my, in my experience most of the time. So if they feel unlovable, they're going to try really hard to post on Instagram or po go to the gym or whatever, starve themselves because that's a bid to gain the desire object or a bid to gain the connection. So, I mean, what, what is the actual parasite? Is it, is it the lack of language that we've had and the ego itself? Is it the culture and the, and the, the straight up, what's the that? Parasite, the parasite would be the image. The image itself. Yeah. The and way, I, I, the I way. The, yeah. The last thing I wanted to say is, yeah, well, why is there a parasitical image of masculinity and femininity that a lot of people have struggled with? To me, it's very simple. We don't have good models. We barely have good mythology or teachers. Like in, with hidden in mythology and religious thought and, and spirituality and mysticism, there's inklings of what it means to be in healthy relationship, whether that's sexually or just masculine, feminine in general, how to rule a nation, how to run a family, how to be good in bed. Like, there's just intimations of that. The modern culture has been in, a, in you know, our favorite term coined last time, the wasteland. It's, it's a desert, a, an absence of symbols, an absence of language. So in that absence, yeah, the, the results are a catastrophe. But I give it to you, Daniel. Thank you, Cadell. Thank you, Kevin. It has been amazing to come together and get this book out. And I'm really excited to, to have the second round of conversation, diving deep into all these topics that I'm most intrigued by. Because it just hits you every day, you know, at least me. So it's like, what do you do with life? What do you do with your relationship? What do you do with yourself? How you should behave? Do you, are you doing the right thing? What is like the, the, the goals that you want to strive for, you know, in, in, in doing kind of so knowing yourself, getting in a relationship, being a holy man, or just being knowledgeable, or all these questions, you know. So I'm really excited to, to go in the second round. And what I've seen so far from, from this conversation, I've been pointing up your papers and papers, writing down notes. <laughs> um, on one hand, I was we have this difference that comes first with what Karel said. And um, when there's this difference, it is meaning that we kind of lost the connection to what we differ from. And um, I've always found in, in consciousness research, wherever you expand your consciousness, which is basically also referred in, in popular terms to feel connected with everything you know, when you enter these states of consciousness where you are really feel connected you feel embedded in the universe so you you kind of sometimes you have even this feeling be, being one with everything you know and um in the contrast you you get back and you feel separation you feel anger you feel frustration if the anger gets more and more because uh, there is something in you that doesn't want to strive and doesn't want to just be in connection with everything nasty and ugly things that come into your world, you know? So if someone yells at you, and this might be in your relationship, um, it's difficult to stay in connection, right? So... There is, is a difference that comes into the tension, which creates also this energy, which pulls you back and forth somehow. And even this pull back and forth is a yin yang in the relationship itself. You know, that creates also uh, the sexual desire that we come together, but we separate us again, we come together, we separate us again. In, in distance or emotionally or because what I've also noticed if you are like two persons that are 
sharing the whole time, every time, every single moment, you know, it kind of gets, um, yeah, you, you lose something, you lose maybe yourself too. And this I experience sometimes good and sometimes not good. Um, about the yin and yang and one very basic concept to always keep in mind with yin and yang, which I didn't wrote in, in the mail's guide, is that between yin and yang, there is qi. Qi is the energy, the, the life energy itself that keeps moving everything, that keeps things in life. So if we see the picture of yin and yang, is actually only a state, but maybe in, in old times, I didn't know how to make videos. So actually it should be always moving, you know? So we have a picture that is a state. There's always the, the chi missing. So in, in this movement, I think if there is acceptance that there is like this ever-changing patterns, you can find acceptance, but there is also the acceptance of the black and the white, of the good and the bad. And if we come to, to think also about yin, yang, masculine, feminine, like the relationship that you have with your, um, with the one that you love, it, it is based on, on the number two, which, uh, in mythology or in yin and yang or as we discussing the masculinity the femininity even if it's relational it, it is kind of an archetype it is an, an ideal it is it is an idea that um to to our particular self we try to 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 break it down to say okay we have masculinity in ourselves we have femininity in ourselves that might differ from from everyone else but if we want to discuss it and make it suitable that everybody can relate to kind of a theory or somehow a common sense of people can understand something about it then we try to make an abstraction an idea that we can share with knowledge and with language so there's where I want to hit the point that uh, language is, is a, a mean, uh, uh, something that you can use to find a common sense, but it has had been always um, difficult because every language has been open to interpretation. Not like mathematics. And uh, mathematics, the interpretation of mathematics is when you fill up the physics. Because if you have your pure form, then it's no information, it's just form. But if you put in content, it is because we say there is a water, there's a weight of tons of cars and so on, or when we want to measure the mass of the sun or the stars or whatever. So it's when we put content into that. So what I can relay like a big way back is that the, the difference itself is not, is not a form. It creates a form, as you said, Kabel. Uh, I can relate very much to, to what, uh, what Gitta Payne and uh, out of the, the loss of form from George Spencer Brown had been brought up that they say at the beginning there's a difference you know and they kind of said that this difference is is a is a cross it's gregory bateson said that um information is a difference that makes a difference and um on one hand, I, I think it's very, very crucial to say that on one hand, we're trying to bring up information in here. We have language, we have mythology, we have these ideal type that we want to be, where we strive to be someone 
more ideal than the real. But the real takes us always back into our particular being of, of struggling. And when I relate this with uh, the, the part side that gives you the superpowers, it's like when you really believe that you are one of the two, you know, or even if you want to thrive to be the only one. And um, this is when, when you really want to be one of the archetypes itself without noticing that everybody else is an archetype too. So I, I struggled with that my, myself and seeing that and, and what I could really get, get most out of it to, to be humble with, with the real, you know. And on the other hand, I, I also just don't know how much you want to really strive for this ideal, you know, because it keeps you thriving towards it. If we want to be in peace, we just accept what it is, the real. And maybe that is a kind of ideal, you know. Okay, I leave it there. Yeah, that was that was that was brilliant. Um, and thank you for clarif thank you for clarifying your understanding of 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 yin and yang as well. So there's so much there's so much to say. So okay, so of course, like tet, like I think there's I think there's a lot of I think there's I think there's a lot of interesting agreement and 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 disagreement and and there's there's just a, there's just a lot of of, of interesting things being said here in the in the la, in the la, in, in both these rounds so like i guess i'll start i guess i'll start by saying sort of like kevin i think and daniel as well i think we're all pretty much in agreement that when a man or a woman acts to the extremes of the image like um the man getting the car the career the stuff like and the woman doing whatever the body and you know distorting herself to extreme levels that this is kind of like a parasitical relationship but but that i think both of you were trying to emphasize that that we don't have to be slaves to this to this image we don't have to be we don't have to give in to this relationship to the parasitic image which which i would which which i would agree with the only thing i would say is that when i look at the culture at large as like an anthropologist what i see in the culture is a lot of people being parasitized and giving into the parasite and 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 it's regulating all the activity it's regulating all the behavior and like the notion notion um that i that i i keep thinking to get to the real of this is like it seems like the parasite is like, it's what I can't speak, but which speaks me, if that makes sense. So like, it's like, there's this scene in the Venom where the symbiote detaches itself from the host and it turns around and starts talking to the host. Like basically Venom, detach, the symbiote detaches itself from the host, turns around and starts talking to the host saying, we're going to do this, we're going to kill. We're going to. We're going to do this. We're going to do this. We're, and all the things the host doesn't want to do, but the symbiote says, "No, we're going to do it." You know. So, like in the in the situation, you know, in the extreme situation, it would be like, for example, the insecure woman. Like, can I agree with you, Kevin, when you said the parasite operates in insecurity, right? So, like, you have the insecure woman of the insecure man, and the insecure woman. Parasite comes off and turns around and talks to the woman saying, you've got to get a boob job. You've got to get a butt implants. You've got to dress like this. You've got to, you've got to be at this nightclub. You've got to get this guy. That's the parasite talking. And then the host is like being manipulated by this parasite, you know, and, and then the man, it could be like, you've got to get a Ferrari. You've got to, you know, get, you've got to get this social status. You've got to get this type of woman on your arm. And, and then the host is just like controlled by this. And the interesting thing is that there's no way in our conversations really 
to go deep into because people won't talk about that that happens to them like it's like it's it, it speaks them you know like but they can't speak it you know like they can't until until the catastrophe has already happened you know until i already destroyed my life by this parasite you know and then i get that i get in retrospect i get i get like a bird's eye view of what i did to myself type of thing so like the question is like when it comes to the problem of language to me you know kevin you brought up it's a problem of language it's like of course language is a simplistic representation of what is actually going on inside of me you know like you know like like tw like say i'm at you know like my i'm so you know all my emotions are so complex you know i've been whatever is going on inside of me and then someone comes up and says how are you and i say good <laughs> you know, like, how often is that you know how simplistic of a representation is language but to me even though language is a simplistic condensation of what's really going on inside of me the deeper problem for me is that there are things going on inside of me which i won't even attempt to represent you know like the deepest insecurities inside of me you know what i really want or what i really need i can't speak that i can't i can't speak it it's not it's not that i i don't have intimations in my consciousness that i need that it's that it's that if i speak that how will the other perceive me how, or how will that change my identity i'm scared that that will change my identity too much i'm 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 uncertain what that would mean what that would mean to speak that i, I won't be accepted I, I i'll be laughed at i'll be i'll be an embarrassment i'll be disconnected i'll all this type of stuff will start to happen so i feel like that's why i'm saying like even though language is a simplistic representation the we have to use this simplistic representation to try to articulate those deepest pain points of the insecurity because unless unless the insecurity is fundamentally resolved somehow then this parasite is always going to be able to operate and it's always going to be able to hijack um us like almost like a like like a like like we're being captured you know but like like a host is being captured by something um but then is it you know i was really interested by your by your talk on the the yin and yang daniel and the emphasis of this chi this life energy um i mean a lot of the things you said i wanted to i want i wanted to go into because what the thing is what you described with the chi as the life energy which precedes the yin and the yang is to me kind of like what i would would what what i would describe if if you know before going into this conversation as the libido like the libido would be the chi the life energy which is which is in some sense like the singular energy and then this singular energy gets separated into two and and like you said you have to view you have to view love and i think this is crucial you have to view love based on the number 2 which 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 i like that's cuz because if you view love based on the number 2 you are not trying to erase tension you're trying to move wisely with tension right which is i think the main thing that you're trying to do with the social wisdom issue and then i love also just before i throw it back to kevin that you brought up gita pain gita pain is someone a uh, daniel and i have both collaborated with um and of course she is working with george spencer brown's law of forms and um and i think you brought up the precise axioms which i want to work with personally which is kind of at the a core of the problem with information theory to me which is like a, it's because it's a non-emotional information theory so you said gregory bateson had information is a difference which makes a difference right so this would be this would be um you know i'm struggling in the sexual field so i have 
to make a difference, which would, which would make a difference like change my image. You know, I need to change my image to, you know, reconcile this sexual difference. But what that misses is that there's a difference which precedes the difference. And you said uh, that it, in Gita's work, it's the cross. And I love that. That's, that's, exa that's, ex that's, exa that's exactly, that's exactly it. That's exactly it. It's, there's the difference which precedes the difference. And if you, that there's a difference which precedes the difference and you don't connect with that, which is basically what is the difference which precedes the difference is the libido itself. You know, the libido itself is the difference which precedes the difference. And then the parasite to me is the image of what the libido wants, which you haven't been able to embody yet or something like that. But it's, it's like, it, but it's like, because there's this huge gap, it's parasitizing you. So I don't know if that fully makes sense. And then there's, whole, there's a whole bunch of paradoxes that I think identified precisely of this relationship between the ideal and the real. You know, so the ideal is the image that I'm constantly striving for, constantly trying to embody, constantly trying to, to, you know, constantly trying to become something. And then there's the real, which is always different than the ideal. And which is like, how do we, what is the ethics of relation to the real? You know, like, I humble myself to it. Do I try to abolish it? Do I try to overcome it? Do I try to, you know, do I try to, you know, um, battle with it? You know, I, and, 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 you know, this is just, this is just really, really at the, at the central problem to me of, of, of relationship and, and, and sexual difference is, is really being able to think this and being able to work with this. So I'll just, I'll bring it, I'll, I'll throw it to you, Kevin. Mm. Yeah, this is like really, really deep water. I don't know what's different this time, um, but I just have the image of, of the Garden of Eden in my mind, you know, this mythical blueprint, which I know we spoke of and we spoke of in the book, but it's literally a man and a woman. It's, this is the core myth, you know? If, you, if Western civilization had software, this is in the code. This is the core code that created the software of our civilization. And this is a story that exists. That's the craziest part in a book. It's a man and a woman on some level ignorant of their sexual difference until they ate the fruit. Because they're presumably the first man and the woman, they probably have perfect physiques, you know? It's just them in paradise, it's very erotic. And then Yahweh, this, this unknown entity which refers to itself as we, it says we in the original translation, which is really weird, it's just like a symbiote. And it's like, I hope they don't eat the fruit because then they'll, they'll gain knowledge and they'll be like us. And then they do and they're like, fuck, you guys got to get out of here. And by the way, you're naked, so cover your special parts. You know, it's like, there, there's something about the reality of sexual difference, which is the problem of consciousness itself. Because once you become conscious of a, of a sexual difference, and like, oh, my body's different than her body. Or, you know, like, even you see children go through this. It's like, it's, a, it's an individuation into a new class. Cause it's one thing when it's like, oh, I'm not part of my mother anymore. I came out of her body. I'm like, what the fuck? I wanna connect to this being that represents all of life to me, Gaia, the mother goddess, which is my mom. And then it's like, wait, I'm my own being. Everyone's telling me I have a name and I'm forming an ego. But then you're like, well, I'm just like everyone else, right? I'm just an ego. And then it's like, well, no, this is Susie. You're a Johnny, like you're actually different. There's different types of egos. and so. You know, this is a rabbit hole into like, it's existential, like what is consciousness as such all the way down to the core is brought up through sex. And then of course, like, you know, not, there's no such thing as coincidence or I don't believe in coincidence. Um, that's also where new life comes from. 
So when you guys both say, you know, chi or the libido, which I think are describing the same thing in Eastern West mindsets, um, has preceded all of life. There's an impulse in reality. And I don't know what it is. Is it, is it at the neutrino and quark level? Is it that matter itself is conscious? There's something that precedes even biology that we are languaging around masculine and feminine which causes us a lot of suffering because we've taken all this primordial energy, right? Like, you know, watch, uh, watch an, an animal make love or like, you know, go watch the discovery channel. Like it's intense. It's violent. It's, pri it's primal. Humanity has classed that and cased that down into two neat boxes called man and woman. And then we have the issue of finances and heredity and whose children are who and who takes care of who and who owes who what. You know, we have this complex web of association with these boxes. Whereas in the wild, it's much different. And obviously we're not just brute animals. So it should be much different for us, but much of the pain and suffering around sexual difference emerges from when libido crashes against institutions, unfortunately institutions would seek to control things like women where children go who works for who classes nations property weapons blah 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 you know we know the story it's on display in 2020 um why do religions care so much about sexuality why do governments care so much about who is in relationship with who and why is marriage legally binding you know, this is where my, my mind starts to spin off to. I know some of these are massive tangents that we can't address in this first trilogue. But, you know, before I pass it to you, Daniel, my, my central thesis in my life, um, and this is really because I believe worry and anxiety, especially around these topics existentially, even if there's good data for it, is no, it's no way to live. Like I'd rather bet on the goodness of life you know, I am an eternal op optimist and I own the naivete that comes with that in some cases, but I trust reality at such a level and I trust life and therefore I trust the libido or the chi. And unfortunately, the parasite or as the, the people in the Amazon and a lot of the indigenous on the American continents call it huerico. They have a word for it. And they identified it when the settlers landed. And what he goes way beyond what kind of mate you get. It's the same thing that would have you stab your friend in the back to get gold. And they saw the conquistadors doing this. And the, and the wise men and women were like, they have a sickness. Like we share everything, you know, there's still problems, there's still murder, there's still infidelity and so on. But not at the level of the white man who's pillaging. And obviously I don't want to make this about whiteness and blackness or, you know, indigenous versus colonials, but that's what I was hearing when I was thinking about this parasite and like maybe the parasite that parasitizes men and women to get the best mate and create the best offspring and look good on Instagram, you know, it, it, it's preceded by a much more powerful parasite, which is I don't trust reality. Therefore I'm going to betray and get resources and power and whatever, because I'm afraid that reality isn't what I think it is, right? It's like at a very core level in the human psyche and it has to do with fear and existential threat. And that's, that's not easy to deal with. Like there's a, like it makes sense that there's so much trauma around that. So yeah, not to, not to pop the cork 10 levels deeper in the fractal, but I just did and take it away, Daniel. Wow. Okay. Where to go from here? So many open, open ways to, to follow this, this conversation. Um, I, I will start about, about the parasite because, um, it, it's still something that I wanted to add from, from the first round and, and I can make a connection totally to, to the last thing that Kevin said about, the, the power that we're kind of striving always for. Because uh, what happens is that the power is like this, this entity which is embodied by the host. You know? So the, the parasite itself 
is the power itself. Or maybe it is uh, not the power itself, but it can be the power itself, but it is also the, the longing for the power. So in here we come to, to talk about um, greed, you know, getting better, bigger, whatever. And uh, to actually have more potential, which, which makes a man potent, attractive. And, um, and yes, if, if, this, if, this, if you want to give up this, this power, kind of, you know, you will, you will have to, to be transparent. That's what Cadell said. It's so difficult to, to talk about these uncertainties, you know, how you, how you just open up yourself to transparency, to, to be ashamed about what you're, what you're lacking of. You know, how you can really open up yourself to your traumas and saying, well, I'm a bunch of shit, actually, but I'm hiding it away. So you can see that I'm glorious and I'm an ideal type to follow because that makes me powerful. So this, uh, this distinction about the one that is kind of the host, which is usually the body, you know, and the 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 power is actually just an idea which we are thriving for and how this this idea leads us to keep moving to have uh, attraction for things to to gain more knowledge to gain more cars to gain more 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 whatever so on the core of that if we want to get get out of this you know and what we're seeing like this we we had for our book this this circle that i could very much relate to the orobus which is like the cycles of life because the snake is a very sexual uh, symbol itself and when it comes to the orobus it's like this alchemical process of transformation that symbolizes also the, the changes of life and uh and, and the snake has been the one that offers this fruit of knowledge. And when, when you become kind of conscious about that, you know, and God fears that people come, become gods, you know, then we are in the world of mythology. You now, again, so in here we are then in this ideal time. And the interesting thing about all of that is that most religion say the the freedom you can only gain by the mind not through your body not through material aims not through sexual pleasure you know there is a way the tantric way to go through the sexual pleasure principle but uh the the last stage of being just happy it is just free your mind you know, from, from any information. And um, this becomes kind of uh, so, so, so difficult for, for me personally to say, wow, we, we want to stay kind of in life, you know, you want to engage with people, you want to make a better world, you know, and you actually have a body, you know, and, and the body itself is like space is kind of always making a difference for us only in our idea in our consciousness we we can get the con the, the meeting of each other you know we can meet by by the skin you know if we have a sexual pleasure interaction but the the real union is not able through the body but through your heart through your mind you know the the sexual is is different as the material as the body is and every every comparison every judgment that you do on yourself where there is shame is is a distinction to someone else so I will leave it from, from here.
I mean, what what I might add is like, I mean, there is a there is a way out to really say, okay, I'm 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 lacking, you know, I'm I'm not perfect, and how can I throw this out? And how much can I just be with it? Okay. Well, to, to distribute the power and not gaining for more. Hmm. Ab absolutely. That's my, that's my ethic of action as well is the ethic of act. The last, the last four years, my favorite Lacanian conference has been titled lack. They have that. That's the title of the conference is lack. So the question in how basically being able to say, I am lacking. How can I be with this lack? This, this is the distinction. The distinction I like that Krishnamurti brings up is the difference between escaping and going into. Because when you're doing, when you're doing the parasite, you're escaping the lack. But what happens when you try to escape it is that you create a mess. You, you, create, you, create, you create nonsense. You, 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 you're playing power games. But going into, going into means that you're going into the difference which precedes the difference. You're going in, that what I always say is whenever you desire something deeply, the more deeply you desire it, the more you have to go into it. Go into the space before you desire it. That's, that's the difference. That's the cross. So it's again this, 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 it's, it's, it's recognizing that it's recognizing that through the host parasite relationship, you have created the mess you're in was created by you. It was created basically by your relationship to this, this, this parasite. So, and I think that you identify crucially the ontological dimension is that the host is the body. Now, because we're born the way we're born, now what are we born like? We're born impotent. Cool. We're born, everyone is born super impotent. We can't do anything for ourselves. We're 100% dependent on the other. Then the image, the parasite, has a fantasy of power, which is what? Which is omnipotence. So you have the impotent body and the omnipotent image. And the omnipotent image is controlling the impotent body. And the impotent body is unable to say, I'm lacking. Because it's, it sees all the other, all the other bodies are, seem powerful. You know, you see, that person over there, that person over there. So it creates this, it creates this illusion, which I think the spiritual path should be trying to break out of, not giving more energy to. That would even be to me the definition of the spiritual bypassing. The spiritual bypassing would be trying to escape it instead of going into it. Like, and then, and what, and what do the spiritual bypass do is they put up images and often those images are images of I'm all powerful or I'm abundant or I'm, and so forth. Nope. But it's not going to the place of actually I'm lacking, I'm impotent, I'm scared, I go into, and we all are and so forth. So I think that's, that's at least sort of how I would approach an ethics for what do we do with sexual difference is because if we're all under the assumption that we're omnipotent and we're striving for the image, then it's going to create more suffering. It's going to create more illusion. It's going to create more deception. It's going to create more 
X, Y, Z. And it won't go to the core of the insecurity. Why are we insecure? And I think if we go, if we go into it, and we, then I think there's a possibility for real healing. And the model here, the model here is what Kevin, you brought up, which I'm happy you brought up, which is I 100% agree with you here. This Garden of Eden, man, woman, Adam and Eve as like the original software program of our civilization and so forth. The, I love this story. We have to, I would love to go into it more. But the crucial thing about the story I want to bring up is the end of the story, such a end of the story, is that they're kicked out of the Garden of Eden. And then they turn around and they what God puts in front of the Garden of Eden, defending the Garden of Eden, is a monster with a flaming sword. And now, what I, here's my interpret now because I interpret the Adam and Eve story explicitly as a story of sexual difference. So, what I interpret as the flaming sword is basically, ha ha, you can't control your penis. That's that's my interpretation of the flaming sword in front of the Garden of Eden. That that's the joke. That's the joke. It's ha ha, you can't control your dick. It's flying around everywhere, and now you're gonna be in chaos. Have fun. <laughs> so, so I don't know if you want to have final words on that, and then we'll wrap it up, Kev. I mean, no surprises there with a Freudian reading from Cadell. I mean, it, it it makes a lot of sense. The sword is the sword is yeah, it's a hyperphallic symbol, and I think. I mean, it probably was a monster, but I remember one translation, it's a cherubium. It's one of the ranks of angels, which to a human being, an angel basically is a type of monster. But um, yeah, it's really, it's really interesting that, well, A, that eating a fruit, food is, is an issue here. Like, like the body, sexual difference, and food. You know, McKenna points out that the story of the Garden of Eden is the history's first drug bust. They ate an illegal food and got kicked out. They got evicted for eating a food, which is, it's unimaginable to imagine like what food could make God exile you. Like it's, it's, it's a, it's a, like that story is so rich and it's still to this day, even as modern people who we have, we know a lot and we have access to the world's libraries through Google. That story is as mysterious as ever. Like, what the fuck is that story even about? Um, but not to go into the, the whole meta narrative of mystery, you know, to focus on the sexual difference, my, my closing remarks here, and I'm not surprised here that we've gotten into, you know, even deeper water maybe than ever. Um, yeah, the, the body, it comes back to the body. I fully agree with both of what you were saying around a lot of spiritual or religious disciplines, the ones that have been, I would say, some total negative impact on humanity and disconnected us, all are all about the mind. It's all about images and thoughts and ideas and concepts where the body is left out. And yes, Cadell, like we're born impotent and we're weak in that, yeah, an infant has to be at the mother's breast and has to be cared for and, and like, it can't even use the bathroom by itself. But, and that's also where the strength of human beings come in because the bonding, the pair bonding and, and tribal bonding of taking care of infants and raising a family in a tribe, you know, and, and I, I haven't experienced this. I, I experienced the other thing, but intimating it and sensing it and starting to feel different alternative people I've seen that's a that's a superpower that's a that's a positive symbiosis not the parasitic symbiosis because when you understand that your impotence as a body means that you have to necessarily rely on your fellow human beings um it actually transcends the dimension of this egoic impotent omnipotent fantasy power fantasy because the real power is in connection and Likewise, in sexual difference, why men are attracted to women and women are attracted to men and every other gender type or term is attracted to another gender type or term is that same force. And it is a superpower. There are costs, but the benefits far outweigh them. Um, and the body itself, you know, this is the miraculous stuff. 
This is all about the body. The mind is important, but I think the mind and the body aren't separate. Like the mind is distributed throughout the body. Our nervous system is our mind. The mind isn't just something that's up here. Like your whole body is infused with nerves and sensation and consciousness. I think cells have consciousness, you know? And I, I don't think science is quite caught up to prove that empirically, but I, I believe it. And there's miraculous stories and you can go pick out any number of them. A lot of them have good clinical and medical data of the body healing itself from all manner of disease and illness, psychological and physical. And so there's a way that the body, although weak, and although we want to change it to appear attractive and sexual and desirable, our body can actually do some miraculous things. And maybe the body is the positive symbiote that we need instead of the mind's image, the darker portion of the mind's image that has created a lot of the pain in the sexual space. So with that, I'll close out and send it to you, Daniel. Thank you, Kevin. I love the symbiote. I also have to say that I'm, I'm mostly on, on the positive side and the parasite sound, sounds like very uh, negative because I related with, with the parasite that he soaks up the energy of the host to actually live. You know? So a symbiosis would mean to me that we have an equal distribution of, uh, of power and of win-win. Uh, so there's not one person, for example, or one entity that lives on the other, or the, on the other's um, resources, to say, or energy. You know, we often can find the relationships that are like unbalanced when we say, or we can also find it in ourselves when um, actually you become someone that is working for someone. So you are feeding yourself from someone else's resources. And, and you, you create this difference because someone is paying you, for example. So there is a lot of notion that is in this difference, which uh, gets parasitical on one hand on, on a very real level, but also on a very ideal level. So... When, when you can maybe empower yourself or maybe it is more about if you have the power to, to, to be able to, to distribute it again, you know, to, to be a person that doesn't need to thrive for all these power where we might get better control about our sexual desires, you know, our material greediness, if we have more uh, openness with our lack and we're not ashamed but we can kind of go back to to a state which might be very very childish again you know to discover the whole world new it is also what i find in in many different traditions where we say okay we actually go into meditative state where we try to just be present and that means you don't have any thought and this is where happiness kicks in. You just are present and active with the state of being that you're in and you accept it. As soon as the mind kicks in, you want to go into a past or into a future, you're not present. And uh, how to, to really get control of the thought is it's a way to deny your objects of desire because then there is no difference from where you are to what you think about and uh, this has been also in, in my daily practice a very challenging you know especially coming from university it's all about thought it's all about ideas you know so how to stay present if you're your my existence has been based on thinking you know as as a your schedule and um and just being present also find myself with difficulties because i want to create something you know i want to be in life i want to engage with life so 
all of that is kind of a, still a big mystery to me really how to proceed in a way that I can be the most ethical in one way with really feeling about it, doing, doing the right thing. That is always like my, my personal big question. Like, am I, am I doing the right thing? And then I'm going into doubts about myself, doing the right thing. I don't know, you know? So how to get out of this? Just being present? No, I just also wanna, wanna engage with people, you know? I just, and I have always this notion to go, okay, whatever, I go to the monastery, fuck you, I'm gone, you know, and I will just stay present and I won't go do anything, no sexual desire, monk mode, you know, and then I know, okay, this is a escape plan. Yeah, I, I know this. I always have this escape plan when I don't want to engage in life, you know. So these are my biggest contradictory uh, topics, you know. Do I want to escape life by being a monk? and not have any, any, any desire of changing and involving myself in life or even maybe creating life, you know? And on the other hand, uh, just say, okay, I'll, I'm done, bye, you know? Child desires. I control my soul, I go to heaven. If that's the way that it might happen or not, I don't know, yeah. And one thing I want to add about the cross, because the difference and the cross has been very interesting to me that this metaphor, it's, it's actually in, in a Christian way, the, the symbol of resurrection, you know, of God dying and actually getting back into life. And the interesting thing for me is that I have had experiences where I kind of died, my ego died completely, or I was in in a paradise state where I choose to come back. And sometimes I thought if I don't come back, I might be a mad person. So this is another whole topic to open up. Well, you would, you would, you would, you would be a mad person. <laughs> That's a, Maybe I am. That's a good thing. Yeah, you are. <laughs> I'll just, I'll just say for my, um, for my wrapping up is that I love this idea. All religions are really about images and they're these images of omnipotence um, and they're disconnected from the body. One of the interesting things is that I feel like with the gender and the race identity wars that are going on, I feel like the same energy in these gender and race wars is the same energy that was in the crusades or the hundred years war. It's the same energy, but more interesting than the religious wars because they're taking place at the site of the body itself. So it's much more close to the real. It's much more close to the cross than actually the religious people were. That's very interesting to me. It, it's, it's that right now, We've, we've got to the point in consciousness where we've processed that the image we want is somehow lodged in our body. Like, I want, to, I want to be this race, or I want to be this gender, or I want to be this. I, I want, all this type of stuff is going on. And, and so I think that that's why we're seeing the religious fervor around the gender and the race topic is because there's the images being processed directly in the body itself. This image of omnipotence and this image of that I'm actually impotent. And the problem is, is that we won't accept lack yet. That's the net. That would be the next next step. Accepting the lack. Accepting the lack is universal. Accepting that the lack as the cross is where you are. It's X marks the spot. That's where you. That's where you are actually so it's true that while the image is controlling it's kind of like a symbiote which is which is sucking energy from the host which is why krishnamurti says when we escape it instead of going into it 
It's what? It's, quote, a wastage of energy. Whenever we try to escape black for the image, it's, it's you're wasting energy. It's not intelligent. It's not smart. And, the, and what Kevin brought up is precise, which is that the real power is actually in the connection. But it has to be the real connection, the real connection, not the connection to the image. Because the connection to the image is going to fall. But the real connection, and my hypothesis would be that the real connection, and Daniel, you brought up that, that this, this mind, this parasite, it has to be distributed again. The reason why it has to be distributed again is because it's gotten concentrated through the sexual, sexual maturation in our genital organs. That's where the image has gotten concentrated because of a feature of our development. Originally, when we're children, when we're children, it's distributed throughout the whole body. But then as we go through sexuation, it becomes concentrated in the genitals. And so then we have to distribute it again throughout our, throughout our whole body or else we're just still trapped in there. So basically, just to end my part, what, what you were saying, Daniel, is that you have this image always that you're going to leave life. You know, you're going to become the monk. I also, I also have the same image. I want to leave. I want to go into the forest. I want to run away. I'm done with life. All that. And, and what, that, what that is basically in my head is that I want my ego to die. And, and that's just, and that's the death drive. That's, I, I, want, the, I want this ego to, 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 to die. And, and, and then, but the crucial thing that you said, Daniel, is that dying so that I can come back to life. And so, and, and that, that to me is the, is the beauty of the metaphor of, of Jesus on the cross is that he died so that he could have bodily eternal life, right? It was a bodily resurrection. So it's again at the site of the body. So I think that, yeah, I mean, that's, that's all, I, that's, I mean, so that's, I mean, I think that's, like you said, Kevin, sexual difference brings us to the to, to focus on what is the truth of consciousness really what is the truth of consciousness and 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 that's why it's so important that we have these conversations that's so important why we go into it really deeply and 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 that's all that's that's all so let's 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 close it out okay i'll let you close it out yes well we're off to a good start and this has been a deep one i'm so grateful for you brothers and you know we're going to be doing, as I mentioned, for those of you watching this live or later on, um, we're doing another series, 10 parts. So this was just number one in a 10 part series. So if you're really feeling these topics, if you're, if you're like stimulated by this on so many levels, hopefully mind and body, um, please let us know, share this out, you know, tag someone, comment, let us know your thoughts. And like I mentioned at the beginning, we have a book coming out, Sex, Sex Masculinity, God, The Trialogues by yours truly. And we have a Facebook group to discuss specifically these topics, share, be seen, be heard. And we'll have an invite for you here on this video on Facebook and elsewhere. So yeah, I think I'm excited for the next, the next episode, gentlemen. And uh, yeah, from beautiful Uluwatu, Indonesia. I'm sending you all lots of love. See you all next time.